Lord, we ask for fresh hunger. We ask for fresh desire to do your word. We ask for fresh desire to do your will. We pray in the name of Jesus that Jesus. we consent with what matters with God. That will be our desire. That we will spend time on what matters. We will spend time on essentials in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, mighty God. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The meaning of God's word gives light and gives understanding. Lord, we yeah. ask that you teach us yourself. Jesus, we ask that you instruct us yourself in the name of Jesus. And at the end of the day, we will have fresh hunger for you, fresh passion for evangelism, and fresh text to do the will of the Father. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Amen. 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 So we need a volunteer who wants to get for us. Uh, we need a volunteer who wants to read for us the book of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Before we... Who wants to be a volunteer? Oh, before we go into that, let's do a review. Brother, hold on. Let's do a review of last week because, one, the review of the pro, two, we always have new people in our midst, so you have an idea of what we are doing. So that's why we do the review. Then I'm also learning, I'm also learning, and this is not a, what we are doing here. It's not a, a show match that there's one man who is a champion. No. So if you were here last week and you want to do a review in the nutshell about last week's teaching, so let's flow for that. Miss Gopal, can you mute? That are making noise. Thank yeah, you. I'm doing that right away. That meeting everybody. Mm. All right. So who wants to do a review? If you want to do a review, you can meet yourself. Okay, but I hear My review is coming from the one we read last week. It's uh, it's uh, from verse forty three. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, you said that the book of John. It's something. It's why are you at two places, but I Why are you at two places? Oh, dear. oh, dear. I'm using two, I'm devices. Using two devices. I logged no, out no, of one. Of, but I of feedback. You have to stop one. Uh, oh, goodness. goodness. Okay. All right. Sorry about Sorry that. Sorry about that. Uh... Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Better. Oh no. He said the book of John will always lead us. The entire book of John uh, is for us to continue to believe in the in he, he is the Messiah. It reveals the Messiah to us. The, that why that was why John recorded seven miracles of all the miracles that Jesus did. He recorded seven because if if any miracle does not direct you to the Messiah, then is of no use. It's not counted. Amen. That miracle is not counted. So whatever we do, whatever miracle we see uh, in the churches today or wherever we go, it has to reflect us. It has to guide us. It has to lead us back to who the Messiah is. If it's not leading to that, if that miracle does not lead to that, then forget about it. And then you made a comparison between um, the, Samar the Samaritans and the uh, Galileans, when Jesus went there, I uh, said the prophet is not honored in his own in his own place, in his own land. And one of the reasons why you said uh, you said that was because um, the, this, the the Galileans they they were with him, uh, well, not, they were not with him. They believed in miracles. They wanted to see miracles. They believed in him performing miracles. So they uh, they, they, they believed. In the miracle power of Jesus, but the um, the Galilee, sorry, the, Sam the Samarians, they, they 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 received him as the savior, and because they received him as the savior, he even stayed with them for two more nights, two more nights, and he 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 really showed himself over to them. He showed himself to them, but to the other side, which they wanted miracle, and that brings us to today's churches. Um, which church, which church setting do you belong? Are, are you in the Galilean church?
church or you are in the Samaritan church? Are you going to church? What was your purpose of, of, uh, of, of converting to Christianity? If you have to check your, 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 the basis of your conversion, if the basis is because you want miracle, then you are on the wrong lane. If the basis is because you wanted to, well, you might have come in because of that, but you still have to be able to change that basis to become, to see Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. And when you are on that, then you're on the right track. And again, you emphasize that not all, not all miracle, not all miracle counts. And there was something else you said about not all. Um, it is possible to believe in vain. Those are the two things. It is for me. I said it's also possible to pray in vain. Some people believe in vain, uh, <laughs> except you believe that Him, Christ, is the Messiah. Then you believe in vain. If your Christianity is not based on the finished work of Christ, then your your belief is just in vain. Okay, so Let's go. Um, because Jesus said uh, that an adult only an adult generation um, seek for signs and wonders. So signs and wonders are supposed to follow us, not we following signs and wonders. So Lovely. signs and wonders are the basis of our Lovely. belief. If that is your basis, then check yourself. Oh, lovely. That was a good summary. Any other summary? One more, then we'll move on for today. One more summary. Oh, lovely. Oh, Sister Mabel, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, just to add a little what our brother has said, the point that I would like to add is like this. The, uh, we also learn about the purpose, the reason why the book of... Um, John was written. It was written to reveal Christ as the Messiah. Then we also learned again that the Spirit of God doesn't have any limitation. The Spirit of God, the realm in the Spirit, doesn't have any limitation. And we saw it with the reference of the, the son of the centurion. When Jesus Christ says that, go, your son will be healed. Even though the son was not there, he, he was healed. The son was healed, even though he was far away, he was healed. So the purpose of miracle is to bring people to God. That is the purpose of the miracles. And he also says that when we believe in Jesus, when we follow Jesus, signs and wonders will follow us, not us following signs and wonders. That is just what I wanted to ask. Interesting. What a good summary. You, a good refresh, because we have people who are here for the first time. <laughs> Who are joining us? Somebody is joining us from Nigeria. I can see uh, Pastor Edward Adimi, right? Hello. Yes. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. How, are you to, how are you today? I'm fine. Uh, you can Good. see Pastor Ernest, and then uh, more people are still. I have, I'm with uh, Pastor Dan here. Oh, hello. Hello, sir. Thank you. From Abuja. You? We're watching from Abuja. All right. All right. That means we have another family watching from Abuja, too. Uh, where are they? Where, are, where, is where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Okay, so there's somebody here too from Abuja. I can see him online. Stammer crying is waving at you. You can look at Sister McCry waving at you. Okay, okay, okay. Hi, so this, Sister is, this is what we've been doing for like. Hi, hi. This is another person, Mr. Lasso coming, also from Abuja. He's watching from Abuja. So wave on. Wave, okay. Please wave, Mr. Lasso coming. Yeah. So you can connect. So this is what we've been doing for a while now. I can't even remember when, when we started this, but we, were, we have been studying the book of John contextually. So we want to continue today. This was, ah, but we can also see Brother Chris High. Welcome, sir. We have seen you for the first time. <laughs> but he's not in Abuja, he's in UK. So we've been doing this for a while now, going to over four months now, studying the book of John. And over four months, we are still in John chapter five. You realize that it's a lot of uh, studies. So we will continue in the light of that study today. And they will we have prayed, and Jesus himself, through the help of the Holy Spirit, will interpret again to us. Now, for those who are also joining us, all of our teachings are recorded, and they're on YouTube. So we can always check it out on YouTube to see what you've done so far. So who wants to, who, we need a volunteer today who wants to read for what? Are you raising your hand, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, want, I, I thank God for this fellowship. Uh, it's one of the fellowships we are trusting God to see uh, increasing the faith of our brethren all over the world today. 
I just want to make uh, a comment. I just, I just want to make a little comment about what uh, 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 the second, second to the last uh, speaker was talking about. Uh, he okay. mentioned miracles. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I like a statement he made, and I want us to not just to take that statement for granted. Okay. He said, he said, any miracle that does not lead you to Messiah then that miracle should be questionable. Does not count. Yeah, I, I like that statement, and that's one of the things we should understand. If okay. we look online today on our televisions and in our churches all over the world, we see all kinds of miracles. You cannot interpret and define where the source is coming from. Okay. And uh, you discover so many of them that are receiving these miracles. After the miracle, you can't you can't define their lives as true Christians again. Sure. So sure. I I mean to say that any miracle anywhere, whether at home, on the street, in the church, online, that the miracle does not introduce you to salvation, to follow God in mm -hmm. righteousness, then mm -hmm. that miracle should be discarded. Does not count. That was our discussion last week. You were in okay. last week. That was John four. I'm listening. I'm hearing you for the first time. <laughs> that was John that. 4. That was All John right. 4. I, and uh, what we'll do is before we go to the next teaching, yeah. we understood Maybe people we will now do a recap. That was what they did. And uh, right. put on YouTube, you can go check it out. We'll give you the okay. picture and link as soon as we are done with this teaching. Okay, I think I'm what? going to look for. I'm going to look for your link to also uh, to also be added so that I can join you people. I'm interested. Okay, no problem, no problem. We are Thank good you. to go. So let's go ahead and you know move on for today. Today is today is serious. So you want to read for us John five one to fifteen. Go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, let him go ahead. Can I? Okay, go ahead. Okay. After Jesus returned for, to Jerusalem, sorry. After Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays yeah. Yeah. inside the city near. The sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lay, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? Seven, I can't, sir, the sick man said. For I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water bubbles up, someone else, someone else always gets there ahead of me. Eight, Jesus told him, stand up. Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Nine, instead, the man was held, was healed. So instead, the man, instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. For the miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't walk on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Eleven, but he replied, he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Twelve, who said such a thing as that? Okay. Thirteen. Thirteen. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. 15. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Lovely. We've read, I've read this story for a long time. I've preached about this story. And I know if I ask us to give our own explanation of this story, we will have several explanations. But today's Bible study is one of, one of a kind. It's a special one, just like we had a special time last week. Today, it's, it's going into another direction, but still connected to what we had last week. I remember one time that I read this. I read it from a book written by one of our bishops, and I've heard him also preach about it. So me too, I preach about it. Let me tell you what I read in the book and how I preach about it. 
this man, this paralyzed man, was at the pool, right? And he's been paralyzed for 38 years. And when Jesus met him and said, do you want to be healed? You know, he said, I have no one to help me because when the water is stirred, or when an angel stirs the water, before I get there, someone else goes there. Then the bishop now taught us, which was what I also preached, that was he crazy? Can't he think? Can't he use his mind? If you know that at a particular time of the year, the water will be stirred, so you know ahead, why can't you start your journey on time? And before somebody else makes the journey before you, you are always, you've, oh, you're, this is where you stay all the time, and you are always at the poolside. And you know that at a particular time, the angel will stir the water. Why can't you start moving, I mean, gradually? So that when the water is there, you just jump inside. That sounds good, right? And that helps to prove the point that, you know, it, that teaching brings about a uh, sound mind, uh, the use of our uh, common sense. And when you hear such sermon, you'll be like, wow, powerful sermon. Because that man is teaching me to use my sound mind, to use my common sense. See, as good as that interpretation may sound, it defiles the purpose for the which the book of John was written. I didn't know any better. Because if you look at that interpretation I've just given to you now, we can say, oh, we can deduce common sense from that chapter. But was that the reason why that chapter was written? Question. Was that the reason why that chapter was written? No. Oh. That was not the reason why that chapter was written. Because that interpretation I've just given now defies the revelation of Christ, did not reveal Jesus, has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. You just look at the Bible and give it your own explanation. That was not the reason why the book of John was written. The book of John was written to reveal Jesus as a Messiah. So everything that happened in the book of John, if it's not revealing the Messiah, that explanation and interpretation is wrong. Oh, but the Bible is like it dies. You know, when you throw it dies, if you throw one, it will stand. If you throw two, it will stand. If you throw three, it will stand. You're not, that's just not being faithful. Faithfulness. You know, Paul speaking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He said, this same thing I have taught you, commit it to faithful men who will also teach others. Being faithful with the scripture is to stick to the narrative of the context. Let's do a text, a, a text, Philippians 4.13. Who is that? Where is that? Where is that coming from? Okay, I found it. Philippians 4, 13. Let's do a quick test on, on being faithful to the narrative of the scripture. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. That statement is powerful, right? So I can collect your phone through Christ that strengthens me. And when you ask me, why are you collecting my phone? I will tell you, Christ strengthens me. That's why I'm collecting your phone. Right? I can collect your car through Christ that strengthens me. But when it comes to collecting your phone or collecting your car, you will tell me, no, I can't collect your car. But your Bible says, or which is our Bible, says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So if it's all things, then I should be able to do anything. Right now, I should be able to raise seed in this meeting to kind of strengthens me. And don't question me. When you question me, I'll tell you, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things to Christ that strengthens me. When we apply scripture like that, we are unfaithful. And if there's anything we need at this time in our Christian journey, we need faithful men who will be faithful to the scriptures. If you just back up, go to verse 10. How I praise thee. In that Philippians 4, how I praise the Lord, you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty or with empty 
or with plenty or little. For I can do all these things I am talking about through Christ that stretches me. You see, the narrative <laughs> Paul is talking about what is going through. When I have money, I can blend. When I don't have money, you will not know. So these two scenarios I am painting, I can do the two of them through Christ that strengthens me. But today, we will just forget the history, the story. Go to verse 13 and just start running up at that. I can do all things oh. that strengthens me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Then you start running. You did not study for your exam. You quoted oh. all things through Christ that strengthens me. You just fell like that. Because the narrative is not, being, it's not selective. It has, it's, it's, it's a journey. The book was not originally written in verses or in chapters. It was written as a book. So there's a journey coming. An unfaithful preacher will just cut verse 13 and just give it to you like that. You know what they have done? They have brought psychology into Bible explanation. So also, the book of John that we have just read now, let's be faithful to the interpretation or to the explanation. Don't interpret the Bible, we explain Bible. Holy Spirit has interpreted, Holy Spirit will interpret it in our hearts. We just explain. So I said, I gave a, I gave a first explanation to what I grew up to know, which I have also preached before, that you know, um, that man was was stupid. If he wasn't stupid, he's not smart, he's not using his brain. That wasn't the reason why the book of John was written. It wasn't written for us to use our brain or for us to go pick uh, positive thinking of Namabise Pil or Napoleon Hill concept of uh, think and grow rich. It was written to reveal the person of Jesus. So now let's go into that story and look at it, why it was written. And from there, trust Holy Spirit to speak to our heart. Everything in this, in, this, in this verse, verse 1 to 15, matters. And now before I go into serious discussion, I just want to point your attention to the salient things that matters. So afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem from one of the Jewish holidays. So mark that word, Jerusalem and Jewish holidays. Mark that word. It's very important. We'll come back to it. Inside the city, near the ship gate, was a pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowd of sick people. Crowd of sick people. Mark that word. Crowd of sick people. <laughs> Mark that word, crowd of sick people, is very important. Let them mute, let them mute their phones. I'm yeah. doing that. I know they won't do it, but I'm doing it for them. Right. Some people just forget themselves, but it doesn't matter. I have my mouse with me here. So, vastly, mark that word, crowd of sick people, crowd of sick people, blind, lame, or, or, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. Mark that word, crowd of sick people. Now, in verse um, 4, is my Bible John 3? I can't see 4 in my Bible. Okay. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. That is also important. 38 years. Mark that word, 38 years. But where we're going to start from, but where we'll start from is verse 6. Verse 6 changed the entire narrative. Verse 6 changed the entire story. Verse 6 is very important. And it's from verse 1 to verse 15, they are all connected to verse 6. Verse 6 is very, very crucial. It's very, very important. And that's where we're going to start this Bible study from, from verse 6. When Jesus saw him and he knew he had been healed for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? He asked him a question. And that question changed the entire Story. Number one, that one question Jesus asked changed this man's story. Somebody who has been paralyzed for 38 years, one question changed his story. And that doesn't end there. That same one question revealed the truth about this story to us. One question. One question altered the entire mystery around this scenario. That's how powerful questioning can be. You know who Jesus is? In 1 Timothy 3, 16, God, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in flesh. This is God. 
if you if you follow back up to John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh, and the flesh dwelt among God. So when you have, whenever you see Jesus, you are seeing God expressed in human form. When you want to talk about God the Father, you see God, the big God. When you want to say God in, in human form, you talk about Jesus. When you want to talk about God in spirit form, you talk about the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus, God in human form, who is Jesus, revealed to us the importance of questioning. Today, questioning has been taken away from our Christian growth and development. We are not taught to ask questions. This spirit that took away questioning from our Christian growth and development has killed us. Because in questioning, we learn. In questioning, truth is revealed. In questioning, we know what we should know. In Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, go make disciples of all nations teaching them all I have taught you. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them all I have taught you. There is no Christianity without discipleship. And there is no discipleship without teaching. And this teaching is not complete without questioning. The Bible said of Jesus, he was listening and asking questions. Can we ask our pastor's question today? Can we ask our leaders question today? This is, Jesus said, go teach. And if he asks them to go teach, then teaching can't be complete with that questioning. I know a friend of mine is here, he's a classroom teacher. How will you feel when you teach your student and they can ask you a question? Is the learning curve complete? Omit yourself, can you just, let's see. Uh, All right. All right. Is the learning curve complete when you teach without questioning? Not at all. It's either the students don't understand it or they assume you understand everything. Is that is not always true. Or they assume at all. they understand everything. Yeah. Well, how come today we don't complete that hobbit that God himself put in place? When Paul was taught, you know, the book of Timothy is a pastoral epistle. That book teaches us what should be done in the church in first Timothy 3 15? It said, I have some good to Macedonia. I am writing that you will know how to behave yourself in the church of God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. That was the purpose of writing the book of Timothy. And in Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, Paul said, An overseer, a pastor, a teacher, a bishop, a superintendent must be able to teach. So Jesus said in Matthew 28 20, Go teach. Paul said a preacher must be able to teach. If you look at Acts 2.42, they're continuing the apostles in the apostles' teaching. Teaching. So teaching is an integral part of Christian development, but then teaching is not complete without questioning. So why is it that today we are not allowed to question? Anyone who questions is times rebellious. But then Jesus said, go teach. And teaching is not complete without questioning. My friend just said now, is it that they don't understand or they, are, or they assume that they do? But today we can ask questions. And Jesus, one question, changed the man's story and also revealed the truth about that chapter to us. In Acts 14, Acts 14, 12, Acts 14, 12, God has always revealed himself in history, even before Jesus came. It's just that people have not researched enough. They have not asked, asked the right question, and that's why they have not found God. In Acts 14, let's just read it briefly. In Acts 14, when Paul, and I think it's Barnabas, went to a city and they did miracle. They wanted to worship him. But when the apostles and Barnabas, but when the apostles, that's Paul and Barnabas, asked what was happening, that's in Acts 14, 14, they, they wanted to worship them after the miracle they performed. 
They tore their clothes and in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, friends, why are you doing this? Why we are merely human beings? Understand? I may freeze right now. I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's continue. You can hear me. Since I put that time, there was a surge. Okay. All right. There was a surge and he's back. In verse 15, friend, why are you doing this? Acts 14, 15. We are merely human beings just like you. We've come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. Verse 16. In the past, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never let them without evidence of himself and his, and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful heart. But even with this word, Paul and Barnabas, who, uh, who scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Verse 17, he said, God does not let himself without an evidence. There's always the evidence of God. It's just that people don't ask the right question. Look at Romans 1.20. Romans 1.20. See, this is just an introduction from verse 6. They will now go into the deep teaching. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Why? Can you say they have no excuse for not knowing God? Just looking at the sky is because we don't question. If you question nature, you will find God. And I will explain that to you in Psalm 19, verse 1. Let me just switch my Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2. If you have time, you can read the entire Psalm. That's one of my favorite Psalms. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. See, Roman said, they have no excuse because if we look at the nature and you ask the right question, we have no excuse for not believing God. Now, the heavens proclaim the glory of, of God. The sky displays its craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to, to speak. How can the sky be speaking? They don't have mouth. They don't have microphone. How can they be speaking? They are actually speaking. It just are not listening. It's because we have not proved enough. We have not asked the right question. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound of words. Can you imagine that the sky is speaking? The weather, the snow, everything is speaking. It's because we've not asked the right question. God has coded many things in nature and in creation. But today, we have been taught not to ask questions. When you ask questions, you are termed rebellious. We are asked to sit down. What are you to ask questions? Can all of us be wrong? Who are you? What do you mean? How can you ask such a question? But see, whoever kills our ability to ask questions has reduced us to an animal. Because it is only animals that can ask questions. They don't know anything. But as a human being, you must ask questions. Because that is what God has coded into, into existence. One more thing on that before we go into, back into our John. In John chapter 3, verses, um, verses 8, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. He wanted to explain to Nicodemus what it means to be born again. This is a religious ruler. I mean, even this Nicodemus guy came to Jesus in John 3, verses 1 and 2. He said, Master, we know that you are a teacher from heaven. How can you say you know and you don't know what it means to be born again? It was questioning that revealed the emptiness of Nicodemus. Can you see that questioning is the character of God? Jesus asked a question, and that question reveals the emptiness of Nicodemus. He came to say, Rabbi. When you say Rabbi, you think he respected Jesus. He's giving him respect. No, he's calling him one of us. You are a teacher, I'm a teacher. Wait a but when his emptiness was revealed, he doesn't call him Rabbi again. In verse 10, in verse 9 and 10, he said, what shall I do? He didn't say, Rabbi, what shall I do? He removed the title Rabbi. If not for questioning, you would think Nicodemus actually know. But he does not know. 
But the character of God, which is embedded in questioning, revealed the intent of Nicodemus. Now, another thing happened in John 3, 8, that we want to read. Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it's come from or where it's going. So, can, so you can't explain how people born of the Spirit. So you can't explain he that is born of the Spirit. Why was Jesus drawing a parallel between wind and spirit? Because the root word for wind is new man, and the root word for spirit is also new man in Greek. So what was in the mind of God when he created wind? He's just telling you that you are not asking questions. If you ask questions, you will find truth. I will say, knock, ask, he that knock shall be, the door shall open, he that ask shall find answer. But today we have turned our questioning cap down. We have turned off the light. The reason why Jesus Christ was contrasting wind and spirit is that wind blows without any influence. Wind blows without you knowing the source. It just blows. The fact that you can't see wind does not deny its existence. What a characteristics and qualities of the spirit. He says, so also is everyone born of the spirit you can't tell. You can't explain how we are born of the spirit. You don't know the source of the spirit because the source is in God and we can't see God. So you don't know the source of wind the same way you don't know the source of the spirit. You can't say, I work for the spirit. It's not what you work for. Ephesians 2.8, we are saved by grace through faith. Uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. So why was Jesus contrasting wind and spirit? Wind has always been there before Jesus came. And yet Jesus picked it to explain the spirit. In other words, God has coded many things in nature and in creation. It's just that we have refused to ask questions. Questioning is the character of God. And whoever kills our ability to ask questions has destroyed our ability to grow. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, go teach. And teaching is not complete without listening and asking questions. So I challenge you to go back to your wherever you were fellowship and ask questions because that is the character of God. So that one question Jesus asked changed the entire story we are studying here. So let's now go into what that See, every other thing we are going to discuss this afternoon, this morning, this evening, this night, whatever, took a clue from one question Jesus asked. Just one question. So back to John chapter 5, verse 6. Jesus asked the man, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been healed for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? That question sounds derogatory. Why should he ask someone who has been sick for 38 years, do you want to get well? Was he blind? Can't you see that this man is sick and he actually needs healing? That sounds derogatory, right? Don't you think that question sounds derogatory? Didn't Jesus, oh, yes. the man needs healing? Why then was Jesus asking that question? Why do you think he was asking that question? Hey, this is God, you know. Who knows the heart of man? It is me and you that we don't know our heart. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what I'm thinking. I don't know the next thing I want to do, but it's not before God. So Jesus asked that question. Logically, it may sound derogatory, but it's not derogatory. He knows why he asked that question. You see, that question changed the story of that man, and that question is also speaking the truth of that chapter to us today. Let's take a clue from, chapter, from verse 5. Let's take a clue from verse, oh, verse 5 is 2. Let's take a clue from verse 1. From verse 1. That's why I said, pay attention to all those things you are reading. From verse 1. After Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Hey, so they were at Jerusalem. So what's peculiar with Jerusalem? What's peculiar with Jerusalem? Jerusalem is a religious capital of the Jews. You find that in John 8. 
Jerusalem is the religious capital of the Jews. You will find that in John 3. Jesus went to the temple area where there was buying and selling. Who's calling me? Nobody. Said Passover. Okay, the Passover. He went to the temple area where there was buying and selling, where he took a whip to whip them. So that is where everybody travels to. The reason why they were selling at the temple area was because if you, if you want to worship, your worship can't be completed until you get to Jerusalem. So everybody will have to sell their element of worship, whatever they have, bring the money, and buy the element back at Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is the religious capital of the Jews. This man was laying at Jerusalem. Apparently, he was making money. You think he wants to be healed? He doesn't want to be healed. He has already found ability in his disability. He is making money. So when Jesus asks him, do you want to be healed? He knows what he was talking about. Because he actually in his heart, he has already, he's already confirmed. He's already making a living. Just like today. Some people know their truth, but they can't preach it because what they are doing is lucrative. They know their truth, but they don't want to preach it because what they are already used to is lucrative. The truth of the matter is, if you preach the truth, you will not buy jets. You will not buy jets. You will not. Because the people who know the truth we only do what God lead them to do. You can't manipulate them. If I manipulate you, because now on that end, there's a need, nobody will drop one cup out of everybody here because you know the truth. So for me to be able to manipulate you, I won't teach you the truth. So some people know the truth, but they are used to the lies they're living, the life, life of life they're living. So when you see Jesus asking this man, do you want to be here? think he was supposed to be, or he think he was being derogatory, he knows what is going on in his mind. And it's not this man's fault. It's called habitual behavior. He's already used to those habits. He's already used to lying down. It's just like African-American who are used to collecting handouts from the government. They don't want to work. If you ask him to go work, oh, I have a, I have a friend when I moved to the US in 2013, I live with a friend. Everything about him was grounded. No job, no nothing. And then, look at the life he was living. We're in the US, we are living like this. I mean, he was, he was really suffering. Shortly after that time, about six months or thereabouts, I got a job at the oil, oil company. And my company, the company I was working for, needed mechanics for the oil rig, or for some equipment. And these guys studied mechanical engineering. I mean, at the college. So I called him, hey, uncle, I got a job for you. They're going to pay you like $7,000 to $10,000 a month. Guess what he told me? He said, you might have start making big money now. Go make your cost that benefits. <laughs> when, they start, <laughs> when they start making big money now, they will, but how much is the benefit the government is giving you? Less than $2,000 a month. But when you work hard, you make seven to $10,000 when he doesn't want to work is used to that and that. See, when Jesus asked this man, do you want to be healed? It wasn't derogatory. So also is many, so also we are today to do. Now, another thing, why that question is not derogatory, let's look at verse three. Another reason why that question is not derogatory. Verse three. Crowd of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed. Mind that word. He was not alone. He was already in his group. They have formed their own association. So when Jesus was asking him, do you want to be healed? It means you are going to leave this place and stand alone. Last week, I was on Pastor Doris' program, teaching the truth. And a woman called, oh, yeah, she called and said, hey, now that you are teaching this truth, there are no churches in UK that teach this truth, but 
when will my children, if I don't go to these churches again, I start to, I'm going to fellowship, how will my children socialize? How will my children, you know, learn? <laughs> Most times, at the face of truth, we refuse to yield to of Jesus. We refuse to yield to the truth of Jesus because of our comfort zone. Because of our association. Look at Bastille. He was not alone. Verse 1, that was Jerusalem, where money is flowing. And they were pity, you know, is their culture because they believe in doing. So because of doing, they want to give arms to the needy. That was what happened at the beautiful gate. The, the layman, it's a culture. You know, the layman was at the beautiful gate looking up to Peter and John. And they said, what we have is no money. It's a miracle in the name of Jesus. So it's a normal thing to be at the temple area begging because these people believe in uh, rituals. So they believe as we give to the poor, God will bless us. You know? So the next thing is in Bastille. He was not alone. There were crowds of people, blind, lame, out, or paralyzed, laying on the porches. One of them laying there. So it's just one of them. And this is another, you see, that question reveals these things to us. Today, most of us are finding it difficult to yield to the truth our quote and unquote association. We are used to our association. We already have our own cliques. We are, we are already known. So when we even know what the truth is, we find it difficult to stand for the truth because of what people will say. Because I don't want to be alone. See, I know of a man. My friend knows him, so I won't mention his name, but you know what, what, what I want to talk about. He left Lagos. He lives, he's living at Ibadan. He drives from Ibadan on Saturday because he's coming to Kenya on Sunday. <laughs> I said, sir, and he's a pastor. Are there no churches in Ibadan? That you have to risk your life to drive to Ibadan. Lagos on Saturday, you drive back to Ibadan on Sunday evening because you want to come to Kenya and not that. What a contrast. So you're going to drive four to five hours on a normal day. <laughs> it's not easy. The same experience that happened to this layman to break free. You don't want to break free. That was why Jesus asked him, Will you break free? Do you want to be healed? It sounds derogatory, but it's not derogatory. Because Jesus knows the intent. He was not alone. They were there in their group. All of them were forming group. How much did you make today? Ah, this one not even drop money. I know this man. Whenever he comes, he drops good money. The discussion is interesting. So you just want to leave that group like that. The same thing. Today, many people have found the truth, but they find it difficult to stand for the truth because of association, because of our environment, because of the paparazzi around, because we formed our cliche, we formed our clique, sorry, because we have our own environment that is working. We are the dawn in our environment. So even at the glaring truths, we find it difficult to yield because of temporary environment. So in verse 5, another thing why that question is not derogatory, one of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years, habitual behaviors. This is what I'm used to. You know, there are some preachers, you tell them that this attitude is wrong. But you know, we've been doing this thing for long and God has not, you know, God did not condemn me. Yeah, he actually did at the early days when you were doing it, but your conscience is dead. You know, when I was in the Catholic school, I was confused at one time. And I was, I told my friends, I said, how can we pray to Mary? How can we be doing all these things? I began to ask questions. And the, what they told me was that if these things were wrong, God should have come to slap us. God will not come and slap us. That's why there's something called Judgment Day. If there's nothing like Judgment Day, then God will intervene. God does not intervene in things like that. We will do what we need to do, and on the Judgment Day, our attitude, our, our, our behaviors will be weighed. In John Matthew 7, 21 to 23, people say, we heal the sick in your name, cast out demon in your name. He said, I never knew you. When they were doing it, what was Jesus doing? Didn't he see the way they were doing it? No, that's why there's something called Judgment Day. So the fact that these people were healing the sick in Jesus' name, casting out demons in Jesus' name, it doesn't change anything. 
what is wrong is wrong, and two wrongs don't make a right. So this man had been there, and not, he's not been there for 38 years, but he's been sick for 38 years. The Bible did not record how long he's been there. But the Bible said he's been sick for 38 years, and he's been there for a long time. So there's something called habitual behavior. So Jesus challenged three things for asking that question. Do you want to be healed? First thing he challenged is in verse one, Jerusalem, he was making money. The second thing he challenged was in verse three, he's not alone, he has his own clique. And the third thing he challenged is in verse five, habitual behavior, he's been doing that thing, for a long, he's been in that position for a long time. So do you want to have a new beginning? Jesus asked. Then, next thing, the answer this man gave is in verse seven. And let's continue in verse seven. So, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone has always get there ahead of me. <sighs> this religion has said we should read five chapters of the Bible per day or by, it's crazy, it's, it's counterproductive. Let's learn to calm down the Bible. Don't rush, don't rush. God has coded the Bible in such a way that when you understand one part, if it's John you want to understand, you understand the entire Bible. If it's Philemon, just one chapter, you want to understand, you will understand the entire Bible. Even if it's Jude, one chapter. Just the one you understand well will link you to every other part of the Bible. Because the entire Bible is one book about one person. Every story about the one book. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 39, said the scripture, for you need to take your have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. In Matthew 5, 46, Jesus said, if you have believed in Moses, you will have believed in me, for Moses wrote about me. When did Moses mention Jesus? How come he said Moses wrote about me? Exactly. Yeah, that Bible is all about Jesus. This verse 7 looks so simple, powerful. I can't, sir, in responding to Jesus, in fact, that question, that answer sounds so rhetoric, so fast. I guess this man must have rehearsed a good answer. I guess he must be saying, you know, somebody who is begging, you always have a sympathetic story to win the heart of the person who, want to, who, who you are begging from. So I guess this man must have rehearsed a very good answer for his situation. But you see, something deeper than that. Why did John pick this miracle? Yeah, I told you. Bible said, history, I think 35 to 36 miracles Jesus did in the entire Synodic Gospel. John only picked seven. And why did he pick that seven? Because the purpose of writing the book of John was to reveal the Messiah. So all the miracles that did not reveal the Messiah, John dropped them because they don't count. So why did he pick the miracle of this man? Because his purpose for writing the book of John was to reveal the Messiah, was to reveal Jesus as the Messiah. So how does this miracle Reveal Jesus as a Messiah. How? Eh. See, now we are going to serious discussion how this miracle connects to Jesus being revealed as a Messiah. The man has John chose this miracle because it explained Jesus, it explained why Jesus came to the world. Note he was paralyzed. And to be paralyzed means he was helpless, he can't help himself. The same thing happens to man. After fall, what happens to us that we became paralyzed? We can't help ourselves again. We became paralyzed. Paralyzed to sin and to Satan. It dictates what we want to do and what we don't do. Because after fall, man lost our spirit. That was to the root of bitterness, envy, anger, malice, and hatred. The first recorded hatred in the Bible was Cain and Abel. It wasn't like that at the beginning. It was because they became helpless when man fell. When Adam fell, they lost their spirit and they became paralyzed. They, 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 they obeyed the dictate of the devil. So Cain could be angry at Abel naturally because he cannot do otherwise. He's paralyzed to the dictate of the devil. So also is a man who is not in Christ is paralyzed. So that was why John picked this, this, this miracle because it revealed the purpose why Jesus came. Let's look at what it means to be paralyzed. The man is aware of his paralysis. See, he said, I have a problem. 
And he said, I have no one to put me into the river, when, into the pool, when an angel comes to steer it. So he's aware of his problem. He knows he's paralyzed, but he can't help himself. No one can help him. See, look at what it means to be paralyzed. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Once you, were, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, Paul speaking to the Ephesians here, who are Gentiles, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the heart of those who's, who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desire and inclination of our sinful nature. But our very nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like anyone else. They were paralyzed to sin, paralyzed the efficiency. They were paralyzed to the will of the devil. The devil just tell them whatever they want to do, just like he told Cain, kill Abel, kill Abel, paralyzed. That is what it means to be paralyzed. That was why John chose this too, because he's revealing why Jesus came. Before we met Christ, we were paralyzed, responding only to the dictate of the devil. That is the first thing we want to learn from verse 7. What it means to be paralyzed, to be helpless. You can help yourself. At the front, you can, you, can, you can gaze at the solution, but you can't just help yourself. There's no how you can help yourself. That's what happens when a man is not in Christ. You are paralyzed. Second thing we want to learn from verse 7, but he gave a wrong cure for his paralysis. This man gave a wrong cure. He said, I have no one to help me. So he's aware of his paralysis. He now wanted to give himself a cure. He said, when the pool is steered, I have no one to throw me into the pool. He thought that's where his healing comes from. See, he gave a wrong diagnosis, a wrong cure for his paralysis. Because an angel steering that water, that pool was a myth. It does not exist. And how do we know it does not exist? There is no counter record of that experience in the entire Old Testament. Even Jesus, when he was doing miracle in Matthew 12, 26, 28, 7, 28, they say you are casting out spirit, you are casting out, casting out demons with the spirit of Bezebog because they are used to Bezebog. It's in the Old Testament. They are used to, Bezebog is the prince of devils. So they accused Jesus of casting out demons with the spirit of the prince of devils. But they never made, if I went to check Bible history and Bible record, there was no record of that pool in the entire Old Testament. So where does it get it from? Assumption, myths. These are myths and mythologies. Number two, there is no evidence, nobody in the entire Bible, old and new, that got healed from that pool. So it's a myth. So he is paralyzed, he is helpless, just like we are helpless when we, when we are not in Christ. Then he is given a self-diagnosis or a self-cure. In other words, every other cure we think can cure emptiness, apart from the finished work of Christ, is all myths. It's all myths. In that same Ephesians that we read, so we read verse 1 to verse 2, to verse 3. Now let's look at verse 4, continue. But God is rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, we were paralyzed because of our sins. He, God, gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. So the cure to paralysis is only in Christ. Every other way man seems to cure the paralysis of being dead to sin, their own myths. It does not exist. It's a lie. It's not going to work. Verse 5. That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised, he gave us life. Remember, he, God, gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you are saved. Only. There is no other cure to paralysis 
apart from Christ. That was why John picked this story or this miracle, because it reveals why Jesus came. There is no other way we can be healed of paralysis, which is dead to sin, apart from Christ. Any other man-made fabrications to heal paralysis, which is being dead to sin, they are all myths. It does not exist. There is no proof. There is no evidence. No one got saved from that water. No human being came out to say, I got him. It's all myths. And life is governed by myths and mythologies. That was one of the myths these people have. You know, it's, it's, he just gave a pathetic story. He is marketing his product. Really, the healing of the pool is myth. Today, church is bringing pool, Bethesda pool, going to the pool and you'll be healed, making reference to this myth of faithful minister of God. To be faithful means to stick to the narrative of the scripture. Don't say what Bible did not say, and don't over, don't don't hard to what Bible did not hard to. All right. So in this verse seven, he said, "I have no one to help me." He's just been selling. He never knew miracle is coming. He's just selling a pathetic story that will move, that will make Jesus Christ to be compassionate and give him money. That pool was a myth. No woman has evidence. Nobody came out to say, I went to that pool. It's never recorded. Even the Jews just don't believe that it's true because it is never connected to anything in the Old Testament. And you know what their practicing came from the Old Testament? So that was it. And you see, in that paralysis, in, the, in that helpless situation, the only way we can heal is through the provision that Jesus brings. So that's the second thing we want to learn there. And then, that was why I read Ephesians for uh, two, four to six. Uh, uh, hello, brother. Go ahead. Even if the the poll was true, based on John chapter four, the miracle still does not count because the miracle at the pool is pointing no one to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. But then, even that, even in that context, but in the context why John was writing this thing, it's even a myth. It does not exist. Even if it does, it's talking about angels, so it doesn't even count. But then, the, the reason why John put this thing is for us to see that the cure to helplessness, to sin, and to Satan is only in Christ, not to any other thing. So, today, Human being has fabricated many means, quote and unquote, to cure helplessness. Some will say you sow seed. Some will say you do feet washing. Some will say God only responds to sacrifice. Every invention of man to help us from the helplessness that we find ourselves through sin, they are all mates. They are all mates. And that's why Paul wrote it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6. It said, you know, in verse 7, it says, such people will keep teaching and keep teaching, some teachers, such teachers, such preachers, they'll keep teaching and teaching and teaching. You will keep learning and learning and learning and never able to come to the truth because they're home it. Today is true feet worship. You go for feet worship. Next tomorrow is true anointing. You go for anointing. Upper week is true holy communion. You go for holy communion. Next one is true this. You go for that. It is never handy. They will occupy you for 12 months in a year. There's one thing going on, one thing going on. They're home it. Everything that doesn't lead us to finish work of Christ is all myths. It's all myths and mythologies. The only thing that will lead, that will solve our test once and for all. You know, in John 3 that we read, Jesus said to that woman, if you drink this water, verse 14, you will test no more. Only Christ can make us test no more. So in verse 8 of what we are reading, back to John 5, verse 8, John 5, verse 8. Interesting discussion, right? Jesus told him, stand up. <laughs> Pick your mat and walk. Only Jesus can heal paralysis. You see, that was why John picked it. Verse 9. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. That's another interesting thing we want to talk about. The Jesus told the guy, stand up, pick up your mat, 
and work. That is the purpose of the gospel. That is the purpose of the gospel. Romans 1 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jews and to the Greek alike. The purpose of gospel is to heal us of paralysis and to make us stand. Gospel is not to paralyze us. The gospel we have adopted today paralyzes our pocket, paralyzes our potential to ask questions, paralyzes our will. Jesus told this guy, stand up, and he did stood up. When we receive the gospel like that, it ought to make us stand. A woman came to her. She didn't even come. She saw one of our teaching on efficiency. She's been going to MFA for 20 years. And she saw Ephesians chapter part seven teaching that we did. And she began to weep from her own testimony. She gave her life to Christ, listening to teaching the gospel of Jesus. I have been in darkness for the past 20 years. I never knew. Jesus, have mercy on me. Just hearing the gospel. That is what the gospel should do. The gospel is supposed to free us and to make us to stand on our feet. The gospel is not supposed to paralyze us. Any gospel that paralyzes us is not gospel. Today we hear stuff that paralyzes our will to ask questions. Gospel that paralyzes our will to think. The gospel that, para, that just put us, I mean, some people today are crying. I, I mean, there's somebody here who mentioned her name. She lost so much of her property, her family's property, money and stuff because of gospel. Gospel doesn't make you lose. I won't mention her name, but she's here right here today. But Jesus told this man to stand up. Who is paralyzed? So that's a typical, that's a, that's a typology of what happens when we are paralyzed to sin and to Satan. Like Ephesians said, we used to live according to the dictates of sin and Satan and the prince of the power of the year. But when we come to Christ through the gospel, he makes us to stand. And that life changes like that. Instantly, the man was healed and he rolled up his, mat, his sleeping mat and began walking. But the miracle happened on a Sabbath. That's another thing we want to talk about, Sabbath. On a Sabbath. Then verse 10, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man, who was cured? You can't walk on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry sleeping mats. See, there is no reference to not carrying sleeping mats on Sabbath in the Old Testament. God did not give in that law. That was an addition. That was an addition. They had dead not carry mats on a Sabbath day. Go check the entire law. Yes, there's a law of the Sabbath, but there's no law that forbids carrying mat on the Sabbath. That's on one hand. On the other hand, the same God, because Jesus said in John 5, 46, if you have believed in Moses, you have believed in me because Moses wrote about me. So Moses was writing about Jesus. So Jesus was there when Moses was writing, when the law was given. So the same God that gave the law broke the law. Do you know why? Because the law had finished its job. The law was given for a purpose. The law was given to a specific people at a specific place at a specific time. And the law is done. Ephesians 2. Ephesians is in trouble today. Ephesians 2. 14. Ephesians 2. 14. For Christ himself had brought peace to us, talking about the Gentiles, the Ephesians, and to the Jews. To the Jews. Um, um, that, that was Paul. He united the Jews, he united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Verse 15. He did this by ending the system of the law with his commandment and regulation. He made peace between Jews and the Gentiles by creating himself a new people from two groups. The commandment of the law is no more. He broke it. The same God that gave the law broke it by healing on the Sabbath day. 
because it's not, it's not that necessary. You go, if you can, for those who are joining us, we have that teaching in, in one of our cities, maybe two or three cities behind about the law, why the law was given. Specific people at a specific place at a specific time. God is holy. And there must be a form of holiness to see God. And God must guide from Abraham to Matthew when Jesus came. He must guide them. So you give them a temporary arrangement. It's called palliative arrangement. It's like a scaffolder. When you are building a house and you have a scaffolder, when the house is done, you collapse the scaffolder. The law was a scaffolder when the house was building, when, when the house project was going on. If Jesus has come now, the scaffolder must give way. So Jesus himself disobeyed the scaffolder and he healed on the Sabbath day that he was the one. See, this is God talking. He was the one that gave them law. So that's why today, when people say, the law that binds you to pay tithe is broken, and they will say, no, you must, they'll they call the law for you. But the same law says you can't work on the Sabbath day, but your church you wants to go work on Sabbath day. In as much as paying your tithe to church, there's no problem. But you're also breaking the law for working on Sabbath day, right? Nurses and doctors work on Sabbath days. When I was at the oil field, I work on Sabbath day. Church don't have problem with that if you work on the Sabbath day. If you like, call the Sabbath Saturday or call it Sunday. Church don't have problem with that when you go work on the Sabbath day. But they have problem when you don't bring your tithe. They say you're disobeying the law. Why are you not disobeying the law when you work on Sabbath day too? Does it mean that we should not be responsible to the gospel? No. If you have met Jesus, you will be responsible financially to the gospel. But there's no law binding you. Because the law was given to specific people at specific time, at specific place, and Jesus Christ has broken that law. He healed on the Sabbath day. So you're supposed to, it's not supposed to. That is to say that there is no law to be kept to enjoy the goodness of God. But there's Jesus to believe. There's no law to be kept to please God. But there's Jesus to believe to please God. Matthew 3, 17, Jesus, God spoke when he went to be baptized at John's river, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? If you want to please God, there's no law to keep, but there's Jesus to believe. You want to please God? You want to believe in Jesus. That's all we need to please God. Okay, verse, um, back to our John. John 5. John 5. Sometime, yeah. So now, John 5, um, we are on verse 10, right? Um, verse 10. I want to finish this 15 today, and I think I'm on time. Lovely. God be praised. I don't want to break it, because I will, uh, the way it's going in my mind. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't walk on the Sabbath. The, the Lord doesn't allow you to carry this, that, that sleeping mat. Verse 11, but he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat. I walk. <laughs> what a testimony. The man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. He disobeyed the law. It does not count no more because he has broken. Does that mean that we should not keep the Ten Commandments? We keep the Ten Commandments in a different way. If you look at the entire Ten Commandments, it's divided into two. One talks about that shall, not, that shall serve your Lord and God. You must not have another God before me. Exodus 20. The other part talks about the neighbor. You must not combat the neighbor's property. You must not combat the neighbor's wife. You must not combat the neighbor's goods. Talking about love to God, fix to God, and love to man. The entire epistle contains, if you look at post Christians, Ephesians 115, faith to God, love to man, Colossians, faith to God, love to man, uh, first Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. Faith and love always go together. Galatians 5, 6, faith that works by love. But we obey the Ten Commandments in a different way. When we come into Christ, Coming to Christ will set us back to our default mode where we have the spirit and the Ten Commandments is encoded into our DNA. There was Ten Commandments from the very beginning. Adam and Eve were obeying the Ten Commandments without a stone because they have the spirit. So it comes as an instinct, just like birds don't learn to build nests. It's an instinctive behavior. So also when we come into Christ, our DNA is reset back to the default mode that God created us to be. So it's not that we should throw away the Ten Commandments, but we obey it in a different way. In, in the Old Testament, they don't have the Spirit, so that was why the Ten Commandments was written on stone. First Corinthians 10, 13 or something, 12, 13 or something, talking about the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of stone. But right now, we don't have stone. If we are in Christ, you have Spirit, and it's in you. You are empowered to love. 
by power to forgive. You don't do it as a rigorosity or as a as as compulsion. You do it as empowered by the Spirit of God. So it's not. I'm not saying that we should throw it away and throw the baby and the water away. No. But all the ceremonious law of wash your hand, all those ones are destroyed. They don't come again. So in verse 13, the man who said, the man who said a thing as that. Verse 11, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Verse 12, who said such a thing? They demanded. The man did not even know. The man did not even know. The man didn't know, but Jesus has disappeared into the crowd. He does not even know who healed him. Awesome. You, today, you will get teachings like, if, if you don't serve, God will not bless you. If you don't give, God will not bless you. If you don't give your life to Christ, you will not experience miracle. No, this man does not even know Jesus. He does not even know who Jesus is. They asked him who healed him. He does not know. Do you know why? Because from what I've read at the beginning, and I was explaining, asking questions, God makes his sun to shine, his rain to fall. He makes, he makes us to enjoy his goodness. When you receive the goodness of God, it leads to repentance. Romans 2, 4. Goodness of God leads to repentance. God, Jesus showed this guy goodness. And that goodness leads to repentance. But that's not just the entire story. In verse 14. But afterwards, Jesus found him. This is, as we are coming to an end in this discussion, this is one of the most important statements in this teaching today. In verse 14, after, but afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well. You have experienced my goodness. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. What is the worst thing that can happen to somebody who has been paralyzed for 38 years? What, 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 what else can be worse than that? What else can be worse than that? Can we open our mics? Let's talk before we draw the last button. Yeah, we have two verses to go, so I want time. Somebody who's been paralyzed for 38 years. What can be worse than that? What can be worse than that? Jesus says, stop sinning. Or else something worse will happen to you. What else can be worse than being paralyzed for 38 years? Mr. Didiji, you raise up your hand. Yeah, I think uh, what can be worse is uh, eternal damnation. You oh, praise God. Go back to your John 3.16. We will say that that's the only thing that can be worse than that. Because it's eternal damnation, that's it. It's called eternal damnation. That's it. No other, no other question. Just answered it. it. That is it. That is the purpose of miracle. Miracle is supposed to lead men to repentance. So to any miracle that is not linked, see, can you say that today's teaching is also linked back to last week's teaching? Miracle that is leading to powerful man of God, God of this, God of that, healed my miracle, healed me, and it does not lead man to repentance. It's a total waste of time. Because the health of our body is not as important as the health of our spirits. That was why Jesus came back to meet him. That stop sinning, or else something worse will happen to you. Now, that is a good assertion, but it doesn't end there. The only way this man can stop sinning is through Jesus. There's no way he can stop sinning, or else he's taking it back to self-effort. He, Jesus, just broke the law. He's taking him back to the law. So the only way this man can stop sinning is to believe in Jesus. So indirectly, Jesus preached himself to him. The entire purpose of miracle is to reveal Christ or to lead men to Christ. So Jesus healed him, but it doesn't end there. He came back to preach himself to him. And to prove that this man actually found Jesus and actually believed in Jesus, verse 15, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus that healed him. Before he did not know. He does not know Jesus. 
Now, Jesus has preached himself to him. He is the one now saying that it was this Jesus that healed me. This verse 15 is where we will stop for today. I will continue next week. But see, this verse 15 is deep. And why do I say it's deep? John picked this miracle of paralysis because when a man is not in Christ, he is paralyzed to sin and to Satan and to the prince of the power of the hair, according to Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. But when we come into Christ, we are saved by grace. But what happened next? We are not saved to be quiet. We have not saved to, we are not freed from our paralysis to be calm. We are freed from our paralysis to speak for Jesus. This man began to talk. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. We are not supposed to keep the victorious life we have found in Christ to ourselves. We are supposed to share it out. We are approaching the new year now. There's nothing special about the year. It's just another calendar year. But then, the Bible says, teach us to know about our days that we may apply our heart to wisdom. Now, it's another time for a new year. And if there's anything we have to be alert to, is to share our faith. Is to speak the victory we found in Christ Jesus. Just like this man did. As he found victory in Christ, he was in quiet. We are not supposed to be quiet. See, the church system that has made us to just come, pick your note, hear the sermon, get out, has killed us. Because that was not the plan of the Father. The plan of the Father is to set us free and commission us to set others free. 7 Corinthians 5.15, 5.17, a man in Christ is a new creature. A man in Christ is a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away and all have become new. In verse 18, he has, let's even read it. 2 Corinthians 5. A man, a man, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The whole life has gone. Paralysis has been cured. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God gave us this task. It's a task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. It's not just to the pastor, it's to all of us. He has given all of us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassador. Why do we go to church to see that? Just write notes, you go back home, you come back again, you go back home, you come back again. It's not the desire of the Father. The desire of the Father is that all of us to go share the victory we found in Christ. The Dead Sea is called Dead Sea because all other seas, ocean, water, flow into the Dead Sea and it does not flow out. And because it doesn't flow out, it, has, it evaporates from that point. As it evaporates from that point, it becomes, the remaining, it becomes very salty. And that saltiness does not allow anything to grow in it. That's why it's called Dead Sea. When Christians don't do this ministry of reconciliation, we die. We are not created to do that. I end with Philemon chapter 1 and um, verse 6. And I'll read it from Amplified Version. I will sing a song. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6 from Amplified. I pray, Paul speaking to Philemon, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective and powerful because of your accurate knowledge of every good thing which is ours in Christ. Our faith becomes effective and powerful when it is shared. Our faith becomes effective and powerful when we share it. Today, we know God. We claim to know Jesus. Today, 
We claim to know Jesus. And we have left. We have left the ministry of preaching the gospel in the hand of unbelievers. And we claim to know Jesus. Saying that they are corrupting the seed. So let's look at this song. I will, I will, I will beam it on screen. Let's look at this song and just follow the lyrics. It just summarizes what today's teaching is all about. Just look at it. I will be share it on the screen. Just look at the lyrics of this song and it summarizes what you have just discussed today. And strength to strength, and strength of us. And the love of Jesus, Jesus standing in strength alone. The harm of flesh we fail. fail. You dare not trust, trust your own. Put on the gospel. Interesting. So, uh, this song has been speaking to me since yesterday, and I would like you to go and look at the content of that song. It says, we should stand, stand up for Jesus. One important thing is that the arms of flesh will fail us. So, he's saying that when we stand for Jesus, we should stand in his strength alone. What an interesting God. He gave us an assignment to share his gospel, and he, God, is now empowering us to do the assignment. So we have nothing to do but just present ourselves. A new year, a new calendar month has come. A new year, 12th month has come for us to stand for Jesus. If indeed we found victory in Christ, if indeed we are healed of our paralysis, if indeed we have found the true Messiah. It's 19, time for us to stand for Jesus. And that what now we say. In the midst of crowd, in the midst of our association, in the midst of what we are used to, just like that man, he was in his group. Jesus is knocking right now and is telling us, in this 2019, let's stand for Jesus. Let's share the gospel with every opportunity we have. Let's present Jesus to everyone that comes our way. The good part of it is that it's just for us to present ourselves. The ability to do that is God that supplies. Just pray. And most I go, we thank you for another opportunity to study your word in the right context. And we thank you because you feed our heart with light. Thank you, Lord, for asking our prayers. We make ourselves available to you today with that our priorities would be to expand your kingdom. Come 
today and in this new year we are approaching. Help us, Lord, fulfill this task that we use every avenue, every medium, every opportunity you give to us to share your gospel. Amen. Amen. We are praying. Amen. 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 All right, Amen. so we are done for today. Amen. We can ask questions, we can comment. Uh, so the line is open. It's time to contribute. It's time to ask questions. It's time to talk. It's time to comment. So for those who came first, joining us, for those who are coming for the first time today, this is what we do for the past four months. Uh, Pastor Edward Amimi, please go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, not, I'm actually not uh, asking a question, but to apologize that um, I went off uh, no, no, offline for some time. My device was down, the battery was no. down, so I had uh, no so please, my, my apologies for that. No but I, you have been recorded. You can always go to YouTube. In the next one hour, to be on YouTube. So okay. good. I really appreciate. I really appreciate uh, uh, this initiative. Uh, we we actually have been looking forward to it, and uh, it's a very good forum uh, for all, uh, especially DSA family members and other members of the body of Christ at large to be part of this. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, bless her. God bless you. Comment, 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 comment. I think we should stop recording now, right? Okay, so recording has stopped.